So I want us to go to the book of Matthew, chapter 3, verse 2. And our first question will be, what is repentance? Matthew, chapter 3, and the verse is 2. And the word says, that repent of your sins and turn to God, for the kingdom of heaven is near. That repent of your sins and turn to God, for the kingdom is near. Now I believe these words, when, when they were being written in the Bible, and still is to date, that it stands that the, the world is coming to a closure, and we'll be more than happy to go back to meet our Messiah. And he stands and says that repent, for he is near. If you go into the to verse eight, verse three, verse eight, and it, chapter three, verse eight, and it says, "Prove by the way you live that you have repented of your sins and turned to God." Praise the name of the living God. He says, "Prove by the way you live that you have repented." He does not say that come to his house and acknowledge your sins. He says that prove by the way that you live, because Christ, while he was speaking this, he knows that a man can confess their sins. He knows that the heart of man can be guilty. To bring him to repent. But then this is not true repentance. Until you prove by the way that you live. If it is that one thing that you once struggled with. Or still is struggling with. And you confess it to God. But return back to it. Then you have not repented. But just confessed your sin. But God today is telling us. That he wants you to repent. If you go to the book of 1 John. Chapter 1 verses 9. It teaches us of confession. But we come back to the same and ask ourselves, then what is confession if not repentance? But then, we start with that a man has to first come and acknowledge their sins. And just as Pastor Brian said initially, that God knows your sin. He does not need you to come and tell him that you did this. He already saw you, he already knows your sin. He already knows that thing that you did. But Christ wants you to speak it out for yourself. He wants you to come back and acknowledge that what you did was wrong. He knows very well what you did. He knows very well the problems of your sins. But he's calling you back into his house. He's calling you back, convicting your heart, saying that he wants you to go down, confess your sin. And after confessing, he needs you back to go and change your ways. Praise the name of the living God. Praise the name of the living God. Christ, verily, while he was praying to, with his disciples, just before he got uh, arrested, he told one of the disciples something. and told him, watch and pray. What, were, what was he to watch on? While he was telling him that watch and pray, what was he telling him to watch? Then it goes on and says, watch, that, watch and pray that you may not fall into temptations. But then we stand to this word, we stick to it, where he says that watch. Because Christ knew how wicked the heart of man can be. And he knew even by telling the disciple that pray, that still he could hold something to his heart while saying that he's praying. He could hold his heart to hold on to that sin, to hold on to what it was, it was making him not to pray well. But in this context, when he tells him to watch, he tells him to be on his toes, to be steadfast, and watch that the devil might not come and creep into him that will, fa that will make him fail to pray. Praise the name of the living God. When he got the book of Exodus, in fact, we shall read it. Exodus chapter 9, verses 25 to 34. It's a long scripture, but we shall just read it. Exodus chapter 9, verses 25. And the word, God, the word of God says, it left, all the, it left all of Egypt in ruins. The whole struck down everything in the open field. People, animals, and plants alike. Even the trees were destroyed. The only place without hail was the region of Goshen, where the people of Israel lived. Then Pharaoh quickly summoned Moses and Aaron. This time I have sinned. This was Pharaoh. This time I have sinned, he confessed. The Lord is the righteous one, and my people and I are wrong. Please beg the Lord to end this terrifying thunder 
and hail. We have had enough. I will let you go. You do not need to stay any longer. Then Moses said, As soon as I leave the city, I will lift my hands and pray to the Lord. Then the thunder and hail will stop. And you know, and you will know that the earth belongs to the Lord. But I know that you and your officials still do not fear the Lord. All the flax barley were ruined in the hail because the barley had formed heads and the flax was budding. But the wheat and the emma wheat, and the emma wheat was spread was spared because they had not yet sprouted from the ground. So Moses left Pharaoh's court and went out to the holy city, where he lifted his hands to the Lord. The thunder and hail stopped, and the downpour ceased. But when Pharaoh saw that the ruin, hail, and thunder had stopped, he and his officials sinned again, and Pharaoh again became stubborn. Praise Jesus. Praise Jesus. I love this verse because it teaches us on true repentance. We see Pharaoh often as the, as the enemy in the Bible towards the Israelites. And indeed he was. And this time... One thing that I noticed is that he went and said to Moses that this time I have sinned. These times we are the one which we, who are wrong. Yeah, this time we have sinned. And he tells Moses, go ahead and tell God, and tell your God, the righteous one. He even mentions the righteous one that we have sinned. Go and tell him to stop. At this time, Pharaoh had enough. Had already seen enough of the plagues. Not yet, but he had already seen enough. And he went to Moses, very remorseful, I can imagine how it was, very remorseful, wanting that all these might be taken away from him. Goes on and acknowledges the God of Moses, calling him the righteous one. Remember, he has his own gods made out of sculptures. He's truly, his heart is at, is not at peace. He has seen enough. He decides that at this, at this point, I shall go and confess to God. I shall go to confess to Moses. Then all this shall end. But the truth of the matter is, we play a role of Pharaoh most times in our lives. Both me and you. We play that role many times. We know that truly we have sinned. And we've seen enough of the troubles that we've gone through. But then just as Pharaoh, we go and acknowledge God. Telling him we have sinned. We go down to the same book, the same chapter... Then we see that after all these things had happened, he went and sinned again. After all these things, after acknowledging God, he went and sinned again. Remember that God is not mocked by his word. And in his word, in the book of John chapter 1 verse 1, he says that in the beginning there was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And in the book of Psalms, the psalmist tells us that God honors his word. To mean if the word of God is God, then he'll have, to, he'll have to honor himself. And just as Pharaoh did it at this time, and returned back to sin after the hails, God did not spare him after. Still he came back after them. Because our God is a, is a, is a man of his word. He shall never fail when he speaks, he shall do. And God is not mocked in our sin. One thing that I love about the God I serve is that his masses are sufficient. His masses are always sufficient. Whenever we sin, he is not quick to action. He's very sufficient. His, his grace is sufficient. That he'll come back unto you, just as he says in the book of Revelation 3.20. He'll come back at the door of your heart. He'll knock, he'll knock, he'll knock. Just for you to open that door. Just for you to acknowledge him back. But just after you've confessed your sin, just after you've gone down to your knees, cried out to God, what followed? Then that is where the question of repentance comes in. We go to 2 Corinthians 7, 10, where we learn about the vice versa of Exodus. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10. And the word of God says, for, this, for the kind of sorrow God wants us to experience leads us away from sin and results in salvation. There is no regret for that kind of sorrow, but to worldly sorrow, sorrow which lacks repentance, results in spiritual death. The word of God here speaks of godly sorrow and worldly sorrow at the same time. One, 
he tells us that in this there is no regret. But in the other one, there is regret. Why? Because it was out of the will of God. It, it was out of the presence of God. At one, you might be very convicted by the Holy Spirit that will lead you back to your knees and truly have it found in your heart that you want to change. But in one, you're just doing it for the situation. And once you're out, what follows? Once you're out of the situation, what follows? It might be anything that comes your way. It might be school, it might be job. It might be anything that pushes you to the limit. At this point, you ask God, where is he? Where is he? You think God is disappearing from you, yet you are praying to him. You think that God is far away from you. You think that he has abandoned you at that moment. But this is because you have the worldly sorrow inside of you. Praise Jesus. This is because you are living with a sorrow that it is not God-given. That you are not convicted by the Holy Spirit to pray, but it is your flesh leading you down to prayer. Praise Jesus. That without God, and he says in his word, that he does not listen to a prayer of a wicked man. When you often look at the word wicked, we see it as a very, very disgusting word. Some, a villain in the Bible. You, you seem like a villain. But in this case, not really. A wicked man is that person who does not stay inside the will of God. Who does not stay in the presence of God. At this point, when our God says that, have the godly sorrow in you. He tells you that once you come inside, that once you reside inside of him, that once it is him that leads you to repent, then there is no regret. And the word of God itself says there is no regret because it sets you free from the bondages of sin. Praise Jesus. Because at this point, every chain is broken and you are free because God himself has seen you to his word. Hallelujah. Now we ask ourselves, why then do we have to repent after learning what is repentance? We go to the book of Romans chapter 3, verses 23. And the word of God said, For everyone has sinned, we have all fall short of God's glorious standards. Mark the word standards, we shall be back to that. In the book of Psalms chapter 51, one of the verses, it says that from the time I was conceived, I have had sin in me. The word of God is not situational, but from the time that Adam and Eve ate that fruit, then sin crept inside the world. But one thing that I love is that when we look at the story of Adam and Eve, I don't know if it is only me who has looked at it in this perspective. When you look at it in this story, then you ask yourself if Adam and Eve had everything, everything, that they could do everything to their own liberty and freedom. Then after all this, why did Eve still have to eat this fruit after being cheated? I mean, I would have done better than that. I wouldn't have eaten it. But I asked my question, would I do any better? God has given me that free will that I have right now. He has given me that free will. I can do anything I want. It's not a, it's not a command that I worship him. He gives us as a choice. He makes it a free will. It's the same as when I have my phone. And without asking Google or Siri for Apple users, that one day just says, good morning, how are you? Then I reply back, then it answers me back. You'll feel that there's a connection, there's a conversation going on. Just imagine that. That is how Adam, Eve, and God were. They had that connection with God. But just as we are the one putting in the commands, just as we are humans, we are one which put the commands, then at this point, we feel that there is no connection in it because, I mean, you do everything you want at this point. Now, God, in this case, did not want to suppress us as human beings to come down to this point whereby we do not have a connection with him. But he gave us that free will. He gave us that, that me and I, that free will to choose which God you want to serve. He did not make it as a command. He gave it as free will. You either serve me or not, but in one, you see the consequences but still gives you the option. But when he gives me this option, what do I do with this free will? Will I be like Adam and Eve? Will I be here standing for his word? And just before we say yes, what have you done with this free will so far? 
Have you served God? Have you been inside the world? Because God says that he hates, a, he hates a lukewarm Christian. Have you been on one? Have you been on the other? That's what God says. With all this free will that he gives you, with all this liberty that he gives you to serve him, he gives you a manual, the Bible, that you may be able to listen or to speak to him or to learn from him daily. But with the same Bible, how many times have you even read it? I came to ask myself that question. I don't know about you. The book of Romans chapter 3 verses 23 tells us for all have sinned. And so does the book of 1 John chapter 1 verse 9, which you can, also, which you can all also read, which says that if we claim that we have no sin, then we deceive ourselves. As men, if we claim we have no sin, then we, then we deceive ourselves. It means even at that time when you've just, you're just outside of that prayer room, just outside, you've just prayed and you've just come outside, that do not think that you're still righteous. Because that is to man, that sin is to man, that even just after we cannot claim to have no sin. That tells us that we cannot have enough of prayer. You cannot have enough time to go before God. It is never enough. I cannot pray for one hour and just say that today I've spoke to God, it's enough. No, there's still a limit to it. There's still more and more and more that you can still do to the same. There's still more that you can do to pray to God. That time that you spend hours on the phone with somebody, can you spend the same hour in prayer? Can you spend the same hours in prayer? Two, three, four hours. Can you spend the same amount of hours in prayer? That's how it should also run. That time when you're at your weakest distress, who's your first call? Is it man, is it God? That time when you're down, is it man or is it God? I came to ask myself that question and I found that there is no greater love than the word that God gave, gives me. That his mercies are renewed day in, day out. That you can never have enough of it. That his mercies for yesterday are yesterdays. Today you have a new one. What are you doing with it? Praise Jesus. Yesterday, what he did for you remains a testimony. He's still doing it today. Are you there? Are you there to give that room for him in your heart? Praise Jesus. We go to the book of Leviticus, chapter 20, verses 26. Leviticus chapter 20, and it says, You must be holy, because I, the Lord, am holy. I have set you apart from all other people to be my very own. Now I want you to make this as a declaration that God has set you apart from everybody to be his own. And being called his own by God himself, by him saying that you are his own, it means you have rest in him. But I want us to look at the word holy where he says you must be holy. He does not say you can, you must. Because God himself is holy as he continues with his word. And you cannot fully understand God. You cannot fully understand him if you do not understand that his standard is holiness. And we go back to the story of Adam and Eve. And we see that God chased Adam and Eve out of the garden because of sin. And in his word he had said that if you eat this fruit you shall surely die. Because the wages of sin are death, of course. But then, if this was his word, why did he, or why, do, why did they not die immediately after just eating that fruit? Why not immediately? Why did God have to prolong it? Why not immediately? I just want you to see how God's love for man operates and how he does not compromise his standards for anything. God knew in his own way that he loves man to the fullest because he had made him out of the image and likeness. Totally, he had the love for man. A love that we cannot explain. A love that no one understands. A love that he had for Adam and Eve as the first, create, as the first human beings that he made. But then they sinned by eating the fruit. God could not compromise his standards of, of not tolerating sin just because of how much he loved man. He could not give room for him to be tolerant to sin for just this one time, just because it's only one time. He did not say that I'm giving you a second chance or anything, just stay in the garden. He did not compromise his word. But out of the love that he still had for man, he gave them a solution. 
made them clothes, just them away, but he still went with them. He was still not far. That is why now we come back and see now Jesus coming inside our lives. When Jesus came in, everything became different because the separation that was, now God created room that you and I might be able to access him. That to date, you and I still have that opportunity to go back to him. That no matter how many times we sin, the love of God still is there. He does not still compromise with it. He still comes and rebukes the sin. But just as we say that God has not hit the sin in you, the God does not hate you, but the sin in you. And a common analogy I once had during my young ages, when I would commonly do a lot of bad things, my parents, when they were beating me, they tell me that, na chapa makosa si wewe. And always, you're beating me, not the, how? But it's the same with God. It's because I'm the carrier of the sin. It's because I'm the one carrying it. I'll have to face it. It's my consequence. The same way it is, the same way that we have in the analogy, it's me who is carrying the burden. It's me who is carrying the sin. It's me who is being tolerant. Yet Christ says in Galatians 2.20 that for, it is for, for, for I died and resurrected it with him. It is no longer I who lives, but it is him who lives in me. That still after this word that he says that he lives in me, I still come back. Yeah, it says, my old self has been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. So I live in this earthly body by trusting the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That now Christ is inside of me. It is no longer I am living. It is no longer myself. It is no longer I. But it is him in me. But I still go back to sin. With all these things that God has done, he still punished me because he has already come inside of me. It is now him propelling my life. He says it is no longer I who is living. I'm just a tenant in my body. It is no longer I who am living. It is now God inside of me. So that means that if God is zero, to, is zero tolerant to sin, then I'll have to bear the consequence of my sinning. But we go to the book of Hebrews chapter 2, verse 11, where we speak of God's holiness. And in all these, we've still learned about the standard of God, which is holiness and complete holiness. But now he says, so now Jesus and the ones he makes holy have the same father, praise Jesus. That is why Jesus is not ashamed to call them his brothers and sisters. That now, because we have Jesus inside of us, he says that he is the one that makes us holy. It is not a man, it is not something we strive for. It is not something that I'm looking to find if I'm not with Jesus Christ. I have to achieve the goal of having Christ inside of me. I have to achieve the goal of having salvation, acknowledging that he died for my sake, for your sake, acknowledging that he went down at the cross, bared all those torment and nails, died for the sake of my sins. And he says that he himself makes us holy, that in this we share the same father, that if God is holy and Christ makes me holy, then it means we can share in the same room with God. And he comes and tells us that he is not ashamed of calling us his brothers and sisters, that Christ is not ashamed of speaking, only, or speaking about you, are you ashamed of speaking about him or are you proud of what he has done for you? The question remains yours. Christ himself says he's not ashamed. After all, he can do anything. He has already done it. He's already inside of you. He's not ashamed anymore. Because now he knows he has made you holy by him being inside of you. Because you've listened to the knock in Revelation 3.20 and acknowledged him. But then when we stand to the world, to the world, when we stand back to him and speak before men, do they see me as a person or the person I am or they see Jesus Christ inside of me? As I speak here as Caleb, do they see me as, a, as the Caleb I am or do they see the Jesus Christ inside of me? That it is, that is how it should be. When you speak, when you talk, when you walk around people, they see that this is Jesus manifesting in them because 
it goes and says that it is your actions that speak for themselves. Praise Jesus. Because it is Jesus now working inside of you. You've now left it aside. You've now said it's not the flesh anymore. Just as we've seen, it is not it anymore. As in the book of Galatians 3.20. It is now Christ in you. So they now should see the Christ in you. Because now God has set it apart and he has chosen you outside all the people as Israel did. And he has said that these are my chosen people. That you are his chosen people. Praise Jesus. God commands us in the book of Luke chapter 3 verse 8. Luke chapter 13 verse 13, sorry. And it says, Luke chapter 3, sorry. Where it is now God's command for all of us to repent. He does not give us room. He does not give us, it is a command that he says for those in him because he believes that that is the way. He gives us that as a way and he commands it to his people because he tells us that his kingdom is near. And no one that has not attained the righteousness of Christ that shall attain the kingdom of God. If you have not received Christ to attain the righteousness of Christ, he makes it a command that for you to attain him, for you to attain the goal, or the goal that we look forward to, all of us, to spending time with God in heaven, singing praises and joy, is until we repent. He, may, he does not make this one as a choice. To follow is a choice, but to repent is a command. To follow is a choice, but to repent, once you follow him, to repent stands as a command. Because now you cannot serve God or you cannot have God in your heart, but please the world. You cannot make God your source of help if the world is your source of satisfaction. Praise Jesus. He cannot be there at your time of need. If at the time of your best, the world is your satisfaction. At the time what you feed your spirit is not of his word. And he goes to the book of Romans chapter 2, verses 4, and it says, Don't you see how wonderfully kind, tolerant, and patient God is with you? Does this mean nothing to you? Can't you see that his kindness is intended to turn you from your sin? We speak of his, pati of his patience. And we ask ourselves that we've been speaking about the return of his kingdom from those times. We've been speaking about the return of Christ from those days. He'll come, he'll come. Our forefathers said so. We still are saying so, and we hope to see him later. But in all these million years, what has happened? Why is he not coming? Is it that we just read a fiction? Is it just because we just do it for the sake? But the truth is, God is just patient with you. We cannot even just start counting how many sins we've committed personally. Those even that I did not know when I committed them. You know, there's even a time you can pray, but pray in sin. That you can pray, but not pray in the right way. But still God tells us that he's patient. And the question that the Bible asks us, does this mean nothing to you? Does this mean nothing, absolutely nothing to you, of how patient he has been? The time where you do something wrong, you still come back to the house, you pray. You wonder he forgives you, but when is he coming? But he's very patient. That's why I love this God. He says in the same, in the same scripture that we've read, that don't you see how wonderfully kind, wonderfully kind, an expression that I saw it for the first time here, wonderfully kind. If you think of how kind a man is, or how kind someone can be, how generous they can be. And you think of how God says wonderfully kind. In this point where he gives you life, even at that point that you went and said no to his name. At that time when you even spoke ill about God and cursed his name, he still was kind to you, kind enough, kind to you and I, that he still gives you another opportunity. Something that I'm sure of is that if you spoke ill about a man, 
he'd totally hold that grudge against you or totally bear it inside his mind in as much as he can forgive, but totally bear it inside his mind. But God does not want to know what you did. He does not, know, he does not want to know how bad you've become, how much of a villain you've become. He just wants you now. That's his word. He wants you now. That is gone. Behold, the past is gone. The new has come. He does not want to look at what you did. He wants you now. He wants you because you're here now, because you've listened to him, because you've echoed to his voice. He wants you now to come back and acknowledge him. Change your ways and serve him, just as Paul was telling Timothy, that now be teachers. God has saved you, and more, more, more often than never, we read about the, the, the goodness of God, of which is good, but we never turn really to look about repentance as something to mend a relationship with God. We never really turn back to our Bibles and look at that topic of repentance keenly. Because more, most times we expect God to work like a one-way thing. That when I'm inside him, I need, some, I need a favor to come right immediately. When I'm inside God, I just need, when I speak something, it manifests. When I pray, when I proclaim this, it comes to reality. When I speak this, it happens. When I curse, I curse. When I bless, I bless. That's how we want God to operate with us. But we do not take time to look at what part am I playing in this salvation. At that time when you bared the mark that I was saved by grace of Christ, that now I am saved, that now I have Christ inside of me, have we ever really looked at what have I done to please Christ? What have I done to please him? You might have done a lot of things, but God still calls you and tells him that there is a room for repentance because he tells us that no man is righteous. He tells us that no man, for, for we cannot say that you've not sinned because it was already born in us, as David was saying. It was already meant inside of us. I don't know how you look at repentance as a topic, but I view it as something that I need to do. I view it as if something that I, do, I owe no man any apology. I only, go, I only owe God that apology. The, the million of times I've seen him, when I, when I've seen him as if he's failing me, he still was there. At that time, when I, when I spoke very bad, remember God was watching. Then you still come back to the house and neglect repentance. You still come back to his presence and neglect confessing the sin. God wants you, wants your heart not to be like Pharaoh the way he had hardened his heart against the voice of God. But he, is pleased, he pleases when we return back to his people because he says it's the joy of one sinner to come back and repent because it's that joy in heaven. It's the, jo it's the joy of God that he has when we see him, when he sees us coming back to repent and changing completely our ways. You might have gone far, prosperous in your own ways and failed to view God and seen it as your effort. More often, we see it as something that we've done it on our own. When you're successful in your business, it was your hard work. When you passed in your exams, it was your hard work. Where was God in all this equation? Where was God in all this? You still owe God an apology for that, but he does not come to ask it from you. It's you to realize that it was your fault. And more often, we don't know the bad that we do. We only see the bad in him. More often, we do not see what you've done, but we see what he's failing to do. We do not see the million things that he has done for you that you're even breathing this second, but we, do not, we only see that one time that God failed or did not come at the time that you wanted. But in all this, he says that it is patience. It is his kindness. It is his patience that he's giving you, that you will realize it and come back to him. God does not look at how big, how small you are. He does not look at the age you stay in. He does not look at how old in experience you are, how young in experience you are, how old in means you are, how young in means you are. But God, just as he walked with Jeremiah in his young age, is still with you at your young age. And just as he walked with Enoch till his death, he still walks with his people till the point that we stand. And I've come to believe in this because we see that a man after God's own heart, David, after so many things that he did, committed adultery, killed people, after all these things, God was still merciful to him. Praise Jesus. 
after all these things you've done, you still like David. You repent and God still acknowledges you back into his house. He still leaves that room open. He does not cast you away. He leaves that room open because he had already said that he is not ashamed of you. At that very point that you said, he saved you. Praise Jesus. We are not saved by a man. We are saved by the grace of God. We are not saved by a man, but the grace of God. Because God at that point, even when you do wrong, he's still there. But a man touch him at the bad spot one time, he'll bear it in his heart. But God is everlasting and faithful. We got the book of Psalms 51 verse 17, where he says that... The sacrifice you desire is a broken spirit. You will not reject a broken and a, and a repentant heart, O oh God. The sacrifice you desire is a broken spirit. He does, not need, he does not need you to go and make yourself go because you've seen. Now go and cleanse yourself the way you can. Then now come back when the guilt is over. No, he says come the way you are. He wants that broken spirit. That is what he wants to mend. He wants to come and mend that broke and repentant heart that you are. And the Bible or the word of God says that he shall not reject that repentant heart. He shall not look at that sin that you've just confessed. He will not look at the magnitude of what you did and I'll start questioning, should I, should I not? But he does, he does not reject that. He does not reject that broken spirit. And I look at Gideon sometimes in the Bible when the angel of God approached him and he was saying that he's the least, that his tribe is the least, his family is the least, his clan is the least. He's the least in his, his family. But then, if he was the least, why did still God choose him? God does not want to work with a man that is 100% capable. He looks for that one person, that one, that one broken person to uplift him so that people will see him, will see God in him. He does not look at that person who is strong to go to the war. He looks at that person who is weak so that he can uplift that soul. He looks at that person that sees that it cannot be done. That that person that men reject so that in him they can see God work something. He's a God of impossibilities. He does not look at how possible as men you can see it or how impossible you can see it that it cannot be done. At that point where I say that's impossible, that, that, that's impossible. God is now there to show you that in that broken spirit, it's still possible. He wants his name to be exalted. He does not want your name to be exalted. Praise Jesus. He wants him to increase and not you to increase. One of us has to decrease and it is me to decrease, not him. If, are, if something has to decrease, then it is me to decrease, not him. Praise Jesus. I might do everything right. But if it is not being done for the glory of God, then what is the essence? I may do everything in accordance to how it is to be done. I may stand here to preach, I may pray. But if it is not being done for the will of God, then what is the necessity of it? If I don't have God in my equation, then I just have to leave it. It's better I cancel it and move with God than to move in my own strength. Praise the name of the living God. The book of Second Peter, chapter 3, verses 9. 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 9. And it says that the Lord isn't really being slow about his promise. As some people think, he's patient for your sake. For your sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants everyone to repent. This just takes us back to the love of God, where he says that he's patient for my sake. That he does, it is not, it is not his joy seeing you suffer. It is not his joy seeing you being ruined outside the presence of God. That's not his will. Leave alone that. That's not his will. His will is to see you back into his place. His will is to see you back into the prayer room. That's his will. He wants you to be saved. His will is not to see you please the world. It's not a matter of seeing you please your friends, please your family. He wants you to be in him. As we see in the story of Lazarus and the rich man, where later Lazarus went to heaven, 
in this story one thing that i always like is that i come to see that the rich man when he was burning in hell he told abraham that send moses to the people or send, no send lazarus to the people to my people to my family to my four brothers that in this they might come to repent but now abraham gave him a very solid answer and he was telling him they have moses and the prophets who will warn them about repentance you did you do not need any other person to tell you because already it has been told to you and we see this in the book of in the book of revelations where in the book of luke sorry chapter 16 where he comes to verse 24 then he cries out for help he's crying out for help in hell because this is a place now of torture he's anguishing he's now he's in a place of torment but then in verse 27 to 28 in the same he says that he remembers he has five brothers he remembers that he has five brothers in this who are immoral he remembers that he has to mean that even in this time is suffering his consequence in hell it is a place of clear remembrance or clear remembrance of what he had done and he remembers very well at this time he's already suffering so nothing can be done really to him but he's now even praying for his brothers that saying that abraham please send lazarus to my five brothers that they may be warned about repentance but then they have told that they are ready moses or the now the preachers of today or now the speakers or those people of god men and women of god who are here warning you about repentance it's not something to be scared of because god in this sense just tells us of something that sh- shall mend our relationship with him and he sees that how patient he was even in the same story of lazarus we read it is not that one time that the rich man neglected Ra- lazarus that god now casted the rich man away Mm-mm. it is after time and he gave him time time and i believe a lot of time just with that we don't have the measure of time to come back and to see or just to acknowledge that what he was doing is wrong and he had an option of going back to god later the same way we still have we do not know the bad we are doing or we know the bad that you are doing but god still is patient his consequences are not immediate because of the love that he has for you because the masses that you have each day are fresh and fresh what i have today is different from what i'll have tomorrow but one thing is that his love is eternal his love does not fade there is no day that he love you least than the other there is no day that he love you least than the day he loved you tomorrow but in this the patience of god i want you to learn that god is patient he does not go back to this he does not go back to what you did wrong and you go to the book of hebrews chapter 5 verse 12 then now i ask myself after all this what do i do after repentance hebrews chapter 5 verse 12 You have been believers so long now that you ought to be teaching others. Instead you need someone to teach you again the basic things about God's word. You are like babies who need milk cannot eat solid food. He says that you've been believers long enough that you still that now you have to teach someone. That you do not share in this love only alone but you now have to invite someone else. But he still tells you that you still have a room to be taught about my word. Even at that point where you feel like I've exhausted this chapter I've exhausted this verse there's still something more that you've not understood there's still something more that you can do it's not the end there's still something more that you can do there is still that there is still that place that you've not reached even at that point you feel like you are at the peak you've read the bible 10 15 times it's not the end there's still something you don't know that's why it says that you still have room to be taught you still have room to be taught by god himself and god honors his word in a very special way that he does not neglect you but he still sends men women of god and skips his word aside you that you still may revere to it even when you deviate from it hebrew 6:11 12 comes and tells us hebrews chapter 6 verse 11 to 12 and it says since everything around us is going to be destroyed like this 
what holy and godly lives you should live looking forward to the day of god and hurrying it along on that day we will set heavens on fire and the elements will melt away in flames he says in 11 anxious to put out to contextualize it there what holy and godly lives you should live he says a holy and godly life you should live i don't know if you've seen anywhere else in the bible for i have not seen how god else tells my life should be and the only way he tells it is by living a holy and godly life a life that pleases or serves him well i've never seen the word of god saying that live in me but walk in the world he tells me live a holy life and a godly one for that matter that is how he wants it to be and he does not leave you like that god does not leave you like that by just telling you that he gives you a solution on how to live a holy life and it is through jesus christ who gives us holiness praise the name of the living god as we finalize in the book of isaiah he tells us 59 verse 1 and 2 if i'm not wrong he tells us that it is the sin in us that separates us from god it is the sin that is born in us that separates us from god but he does not leave it from there he says it's your sins that have cut you off from god because of your sins he has not turned away and will listen and will not listen anymore and then in in the next one your hands are the hands of murderers your fingers are filthy with sin your lips are full of lies your mouth spews corruption we continue to verse 4 no one cares about being fair and honest the people's lawsuits are based on lies they conceive evil deeds and then give birth to sin praise jesus in this we see that it is our sin that totally removes us from the presence of god but he says that his hand is not short and that he cannot reach you that his hand is not short that he cannot reach you his ears are not dumb that he cannot deaf that he cannot listen to you he still gives you that room he still gives you another opportunity regardless of what you've done and still calls you back to his house still calls you back to share in his joy and love still keeps his promises as he says that you will soar high like the eagles because that is his word we play a role like the prodigal son that we've ran away but now here we are you've now come back he says that you were gone but now you're here you were once lost but now you're found and who has found you it is jesus that has found me i don't know about you jesus is the one that found me i have shared in his love for years and i've never seen him fail any man and just as we are he says that that do not re- that remember god in the days of your youth that remember god in the days of your youth that do not neglect god in the days of your youth that you shall say that i'm still young i still have a lot to do i'll revere god in the future do not forget god in the days of your youth and just as god raised the dry bones in ezekiel back to life he's still ready to raise that dry heart of yours back to life he's still ready to raise that heart that had gone away astray back to him back to his presence we read the book of john chapter 9 verse 31 john chapter 9 verse 31 we know that god doesn't listen to sinners but he's ready to listen to those who worship and do his will he does not listen to a sinner but if you worship and return and do his will he is absolutely ready it does not mean you're righteous but he's just ready to listen to that person who has revered and come back to his house in the book of second chronicles chapter 30 verse 9 as i invite as i invite the ibadah team it says second chronic for if you return to the lord your relatives and your children will be treated mercifully by their captures and they will be able to return to this land for the lord your god is gracious and merciful if you return to him he will not continue to turn his face from you this just clearly shows us that at the time of our sin he casts us away from his presence but at the time that you've returned he does not cast you away the time that you've returned to god he returns back and looks back at you he does not want to see what you've done god wants you to return to his presence 
His, word be, his words bears a lot inside of me. When I just think of how loving or how merciful God has been to me, it brings me down to my knees because I know of how wicked my heart is. And he tells me that how then can I guard my heart from sin? How can a young man guard his heart from sin? And he says by keeping his word. Because he knows that his word is right. He knows that when you have his word inside, inside your heart, then you can never go wrong in this context. Because God says that he honors his word and he himself is his word. As in the book of John chapter 1 verse 1. God honors himself and even he brings himself down to you. Just as Christ brought himself down to you when he came to earth. That we cannot say that there is nothing God hasn't experienced. Because God in his own way, in form of Christ, in form of flesh and blood, as he came, he came and faced it all. If it was anguish, if it was depression, he faced it at the mountains. If it was a point where he cried, he cried at the time for God to take away the, the sorrow from him. If it was at the time of joy, he shared joy with the people and the disciples. If it was teaching, he taught. And if it was learning, he learned at the temples when he was still young and still learned from God. He says that he knows God. That is what he was telling the Pharisees. I want you to say that you know God inside your heart. That now you have that room for him. And now you are ready to come back to that heart of worship. Just as we sang before. Because now God just wants that heart. He wants that repentant spirit. He wants that godly sorrow from you. He does not want the worldly sorrow. He is not interested in that. He does not look at that past that has gone. His hand is not short enough that he cannot reach you. You've not deviated far that he cannot reach you. You've not gotten too far that you've now out of his presence. He's still there. I want us to be on our feet. Even as we pray this morning. And speak of his love. Faithful Lord, you've been so faithful. I want us to speak about the love of God. I want you to proclaim the love of God and His patience over you. To take a moment and to repent of the sins that you've done. Because it is His love that has brought you here. It is by His grace that you're standing here. It is this life that you're breathing. It is the breath of God that He breathed inside of you. Faithful God, here we are once again. As your sons and daughters saying, Lord, that truly we've gone astray from your sins in ways that we knew and in ways that we didn't, Lord. But here, Father, we've come back to your house to proclaim of this lovely name of Jesus Christ, to proclaim of this greater name that there is no other because your word says that every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. I want you to pray and to repent of your sins and to confess because God knows and the, the deepest of your secrets. It is His grace. It is His grace. Nemaya ko familia yangu ikujue funua nemaya ko matai fa yote yakujue funua nemaya. grace that you're here it is not a debt that you can pay but he gave you Jesus Christ for your sake and for my sake and it is by his grace that you're here it is not your doing it is his own I want you to know that you cannot do it but God can do it for you Akuna ahad. you can't give anything to God but just your heart that is all that you can give to him. It is his grace. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord.
I want to go back to that song. It comes and tells us that ikiwa ipo ahadi, it's Jesus to pay it. It is Jesus that can pay that price for me by dying at that cross that he did for me. Basi kiwa ipo ahadi Ya kuingia rahani mwako Sitaki kukosa Nani wapenda o Haya ni maombi yangu kwako Mwote ni na Wapenda wasipitwe na nema yako Na nema yako Haya ni maombi yangu Haya ni maombi It's my prayer Jesus Oh, wote ni na Wapenda wasipitwe na nema yako It is His grace that is sufficient. Let us believe as we pray. Faithful God, great of all heavens and earth, we bow down before this altar, saying, Worthy is your name, Jesus. Tunasema asante kwa neema yako, Yesu. We say thank you for it is your presence that has been in this place. It is by the guidance and by the help of the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus, because, Lord, you've been so kind and so faithful, bearing with us even the sins that you committed, Jesus. You have been still there through the times, through thick and thin, through ups and downs, through the greatest of times and through the worst of our nightmares. Jesus, you remain there. You do not change, my God. You're the same God yesterday, today, and forevermore. And that's something we praise your name for, God. That you say that you're not ashamed of us, Jesus. Teach us even how to walk by these ways, oh God. That, Lord, you are not ashamed to calling us your own. But, Lord, you say that we are now in you, God, in repentance, oh God. Teach us, my Lord, how to pray, how to repent. For, Lord, we do not know how to repent. But, Lord, it is because of your mercies. Lord, let the Holy Spirit follow us even as we depart, O oh God. Let, Lord, your love continue being and shining in us, Jesus. The Lord, you shall be seen in us and not our own mortal selves, my God. Because this is a prayer that we make in you, O oh God. In the name of Jesus, we do pray and believe.